the purpose. The life of man upon earth is a warfare. Job 7.1 What follows is for those who want to change the world from what it is to what they believe it should be. The Prince was written by Machiavelli for the haves on how to hold power. Rules for Radicals is written for the have-nots on how to take it away. In this book, we're concerned with how to create mass organizations to seize power and give it to people. To realize the democratic dream of equality, justice, peace, cooperation, equal and full opportunities for education, full and useful employment, see Bob Black on that one, health and the creation of those circumstances in which man can have the chance to live by values that give meaning to life. We're talking about a mass power organization which will change the world into a place where all men and women walk erect in the spirit of that credo of the Spanish Civil War. Better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. This means revolution. The significant changes in history have been made by revolutions. There are people who say that it's not revolution, but evolution that brings about change. But evolution is simply the term used by non-participants to denote particular sequence of revolutions as they synthesized into a specific major social change. In this book, I propose certain general observations, propositions, and concepts of the mechanics of mass movements and the various stages of the cycles of action and reaction in revolution. This is not an ideological book, except insofar as argument for change, rather than for the status quo, can be called an ideology, different, uh, different people, Different, uh, in different places, in different situations, and different times, will construct their own solutions and symbols of salvation for those times. This book will not contain any panacea or dogma. I detest and fear dogma. I know that all revolutions must have ideologies to spur them on, that in the heat of conflict, these ideologies tend to be smelted into rigid dogmas, claiming exclusive possession of truth and that the keys to paradise is tragic. Dogma is the enemy of human freedom. Dogma must be watched for and apprehended at every turn and twist of the revolutionary movement. The human spirit glows from that small inner light of doubt whether we're right. While those who believe with complete certainty that they possess the right are dark inside and darken the world outside with cruelty, pain, and injustice. Those who enshrine the poor or have-nots are as guilty as other dogmatists and just as dangerous. To diminish the danger that ideology will deteriorate into dogma and to protect the free, open, questing, and creative mind of man, as well as to allow for change, no ideology should be more specific than that of America's founding fathers for the general welfare. Niels Bohr, the great atomic physicist, admirably stated that si the civilized position on dogmatism, every sentence I utter must be understood not as an, affirmative, uh, uh, as an affirmation, but as a question. I will argue that man's hopes lie in the acceptance of the great law of change and that a general understanding of the principles of change will provide clues for rational action and an awareness of the realistic relationship between means and ends and how each determines the other. I hope that these pages will contribute to the education of the radicals of today and to the conversion of hot, emotional, impulsive passions that are impotent and frustrating to actions that will be calculated, purposeful, and effective. An example of the political insensitivity of many of today's so-called radicals and the lost opportunities is found in this account of an episode during the trial of the Chicago 7. Over the weekend, some 150 lawyers from all parts of the country had gathered in Chicago to picket the federal building in protest against Judge Hoffman's arrest of the four lawyers 
This delegation, which was supported by 13 members of the faculty of Harvard Law School and which included a number of other professors as well, submitted a brief as friend of the court which called Judge Hoffman's actions a travesty of, a travesty of justice which threatens to destroy the confidence of the American people in the entire judicial process. By 10 o'clock, the angry lawyers had begun to march around the federal building, where they were joined by hundreds of student radicals, several Black Panthers, and a hundred or more blue-helmeted Chicago police. Shortly before noon, about 40 of the picketing lawyers carried their signs into the lobby of the federal building, despite the notice posted on the glass wall beside the entrance and signed by Judge Campbell, forbidding such demonstrations within the building. Hardly had the lawyers entered, however, than Judge Campbell himself descended into the lobby, dressed in his black robes and accompanied by a marshal, a stenographer, and his court clerk. Surrounded by the angry lawyers who were themselves encircled by a ring of police and federal marshals, the judge proceeded to hold court then and there. He announced that unless the pickets withdrew immediately, he would charge them with contempt. This time, he warned, there could be no question that their contempt would occur in the presence of the court and would thus be subject to summary punishment. No sooner had he made this announcement, however, than a voice from the throng shouted, Fuck you, Campbell! After a moment of tense silence, Followed by a cheer from the crowd and a noticeable stiffening amongst the police, Judge Campbell himself withdrew. Then the lawyers, too, left the lobby and rejoined the pickets on the sidewalk. Written by Jason Epstein, The Great Conspiracy Trial, Random House, published 1970. The picketing lawyers threw away a beautiful opportunity to create a nationwide issue. Offhand, there would have been to, there would seem to have been two choices, either of which would have forced the judge's hand and kept the issue going. Some uh, some one of the lawyers could have stepped up to the judge after the voice said "fuck you, Campbell," and said that the lawyers there did not support personal obscenities, but they were not leaving. Or all the lawyers together could have chorused with one voice and said "fuck you, Campbell." They did neither. Instead, they let the initiative pass from them to the judge and achieve nothing. Radicals must be resilient, adaptable to shifting political circumstances, and sensitive enough to the process of action and reaction to avoid being trapped by their own tactics and forced to travel a road not of their own choosing. In short, Radicals must have a degree of control over the flow of events. Here, I propose to present an arrangement of certain facts and general concepts of change, a step towards a science of revolution. All societies discourage and penalize ideas and writings that threaten the ruling status quo. It is understandable, therefore, that the literature of a have society is a veritable desert whenever we look for, uh, for writings on social change. Once the American Revolution was done with, we can find very little besides the right of revolution that is laid down in the Declaration of Independence as a fundamental right. 73 years later, Thoreau's brief es a brief essay on the duty of civil disobedience, followed by Lincoln's reaffirmation of the revolutionary right in 1861. <clears throat> there are many phrases extolling the sacredness of revolution, that is, revolutions of the past. Our enthusiasm for the sacred right of revolution is increased and enhanced with the passage of time. The older the revolution, the more it recedes into history and the more sacred it becomes. Except for Thoreau's limited remarks, our society has given us very few words of advice, few suggestions of how to fertilize social change. From the haves, on the other hand, there's come an unceasing flood of literature justifying the status quo, Religious, economic, social, political, and legal tracts endlessly attack all revolutionary ideas and action for change as immoral, fallacious, and against God, country, and mother. 
These literary seditions by the status quo include the threat that since all such movements are unpatriotic, subversive, spawned in hell and reptilian in their creeping insidiousness, dire punishments will be meted out to those supporters. All great revolutions, including Christianity, the various reformations, democracy, capitalism, and socialism have suffered these epithets in the times of their birth. To the status quo concerned about its public image, revolution is the only force which has no image, but instead casts a dark, ominous shadow of things to come. The have-nots of the world, swept up in their present upheavals and desperately seeking revolutionary writings, can find such literature only from the communists, both red and yellow, and sometimes the anarchists. Have Here they can read about tactics, maneuvers, strategies, principles of action in the making of revolutions, since in this literature all ideas are embedded in the language of communism. Revolution appears synonymous with communism. When in the throes of their revolutionary fervor, the have-nots hungrily turn us to the, in their fir first few steps from star uh, starvation to subsistence. We respond with a bewildering, unbelievable, and meaningless conglomeration of abstractions about freedom, mor morality, equality, and the danger of intellectual enslavement by communistic ideology. This is accompanied by charitable handouts dressed up in ribbons of moral principle and freedom, with the price tag of unqualified political loyalty to us. With the coming of the revolutions in Russia and China, we suddenly underwent a moral conversion and became concerned for the welfare of our brothers all over the world. Revolution by the have-nots has a way of inducing a moral revolution amongst the haves. Revolution by the have-nots also induced a paranoid fear. Now, therefore, we find every corrupt and repressive government the world around saying to us, Give us money and soldiers or there will be a revolution and the new leaders will be your enemies. Fearful of revolutions and identifying ourselves as the status quo, we've permitted the communists to assume by default the revolutionary halo of justice for the have-nots. When then compound, We then compound this mistake by assuming that the status quo everywhere must be defended and buttressed against revolution. Today, revolution has become synonymous with communism, while capitalism is synonymous with status quo. Occasionally, we'll accept a revolution if it's guaranteed to be on our side, and then only when we realize that the revolution is inevitable. We abhor revolutions. We've permitted a suicidal situation to unfold wherein revolution and communism have become one. These pages are committed to splitting this political atom, separating this exclusive identification of communism with revolution. If it were possible for the have-nots of the world to recognize and accept the idea that revolution, a revolution did not inevitably mean hate and war, cold or hot, from the United States, that alone would be a great revolution in world politics and the future of man. This is a major reason for my attempt to provide a revolutionary handbook, not cast in a communist or capitalist mold but as a manual for the have-nots of the world regardless of the color of their skin or their politics. My aim here is to suggest how to organize for power, how to get it, and how to use it. I will argue that the failure to use power for a more equitable distribution of the means of life for all people signals the end of the revolution and the start of the counter-revolution. Revolution has always advanced with an ideological spear just as the status quo has inscribed its ideology upon its shield. All of life is partisan. There is no dispassionate objectivity. The revolutionary ideology is not confined to a specific limited formula. It is a series of general principles rooted in Lincoln's May, 19, uh, May, 50, uh, Lincoln's May 19th, 1856 statement, Be not deceived. Revolutions do not go backwards. The ideology of change. This raises the question, what, if any, is my ideology? What, what kind of ideology, if any, can an organizer who is working in and for a free society? 
The prerequisite for an ideology is possession of a basic truth. For example, a Marxist begins with his prime truth that all evils are caused by the exploitation of the proletariat by the capitalists. From this, he logically proceeds to the revolution to end capitalism. Then into the third stage of reorganization into a new social order or the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Christians also begin with their prime truth, the divinity of Christ and the trip, uh, triperate uh, 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 nature of God. Out of these prime truths flow a step-by-step -step ideology. An organizer working in and for an open society is an ideological dilemma. To begin with, he does not have a fixed truth. Truth to him is relative and changing. Everything to him is relative and changing. Politi he is a political relativist. Accepts the late Justice Learned Hand's statement that the mark of a free man is that the ever-gnawing inner uncertainty as to whether or not he is right. The consequence is that He's ever on the hunt for the cause of man's plights and the general propo uh, propositions that help to make some sense out of the man's irrational world. He must com constantly examine life, including his own, to get some ideas of what it's all about, and he must challenge and test his own findings. Irreverence, essential to questioning, is a requisite. Curiosity becomes compulsive. His most frequent word is why. Some say it's no coincidence that the question mark is an inverted plow breaking up the hard soil of old beliefs and preparing for the new growth. Does this then mean that the organizer in a free society for a free society is rudderless? No. I believe that they have a far better sense of direction and compass than the closed society organizer with their rigid political ideology. First, the free society organizer is loose resilient, fluid, and on the move in a society which itself is in a state of constant change. To the extent that they are free from the shackles of dogma, they can respond to the realities of the widely different situations our society presents. In the end, they have one conviction, a belief that if people have the power to act, in the long run they will, most of the time, reach the right decisions. The alternative to this would be ruled by the elite, either a dictatorship or some form of political aristocracy. I'm not concerned if this faith in people is regarded as a prime truth and therefore a contradiction of what I've already written, for life is a story of contradictions. Believing in people, the radical has the job of organizing them so that they will have the power and opportunity to best meet each unforeseeable future crisis as they move ahead in their eternal search for those values of equality, justice, freedom, peace, and a deep concern for the preciousness of human life and all those rights and values propounded by the Judeo-Christianity and the political, democratic political tradition. Democracy is not an end but a means towards achieving these values. This is my credo for which I live, and if need be, die. The basic requirement for the understanding of the politics of change is to recognize the world as it is. We must work with it on its own terms if we are to change it to the kind of world we would like it to be. We must first see the world as it is and not as we would like it to be. We must see the world as all political realists have in terms of, quote, what men do and not what they ought to do, as Machiavelli and others put it. It is painful to accept fully the simple fact that one begins from where one is. That one must break free of the web of illusions one spins about life. Most of us view the world not as it is, but as we would like it to be. The preferred world can be seen any evening on television, in the succession of programs where the good always wins, that is, until the late evening newscast, when suddenly we're plunged into the world as it is. With some exceptions, in one of America's Shangri-Las of Escape from the World as it is, Carmel by, the sea, uh, Carmel by the Sea, California, on the coast of the beautiful Monterey Peninsula, radio station KRML used to broadcast the Sunshine News, 
which headlines the positive, only the good news in the world. Intellectuals would scoff at sunshine news as there are no exceptions to the preference for already formulated answers. Political realists see the world as it is. An arena of power politics moved primarily by perceived immediate self-interest where morality is rhetorical rationale for expedient action and self-interest. Two examples would be the priest who wants to be a bishop and bootlicks and politics his way up, justifying it with the rationale, well, after I get to be a bishop, I'll use my office for Christian reformation. Or the businessman who reasons, first I'll make my million, and after that, I'll go for the real things in life. Unfortunately, one changes in many ways on the road to the bishoric, uh, the, the, yeah, bishoric, uh, or the first million. And then one says, I'll wait until I'm a cardinal, and then I can be more effective. Or I can do a lot more after I get two million, and so it goes. In this world, laws are written for the lofty aim of the common good, and then acted out in, uh, in life on the basis of the common greed. In this world, irrationality clings to man like his shadow so that the right things are done for the wrong reasons. Afterwards, we dredge up the right reasons for justification. It is a world not of angels, but of angles, where men speak of moral principles, but act on power principles, where men speak, uh, where we are always moral and our en enemies are always immoral. A world where reconciliation means that when one side gets the power and the other side gets reconciled to it, then we have reconciliation. A world of religious institutions that have, in the main, come to support and justify the status quo. So that today, organized religion is materially solvent and spiritually bankrupt. We live with a Judeo-Christian ethic that has not only accompanied, uh, accommodated itself to, but justified slavery, war, and every other human, uh, ugly human exploitation of which ever status quo happened to prevail. We live in a world where good is a value dependent on whether we want it. In the world as it is, the solution of each problem inevitably creates a new one. In the world as it is, there are no permanent happy or sad endings. Such endings belong to the world of fantasy, the world as we would like it to be, the world of children's fairy tales where they lived happily ever after. In the world as it is, the stream of events surges endlessly onward with death as the only terminus. One never reaches the horizon. It's always just beyond, ever beckoning onward. It is the pursuit of life itself. This is the world as it is. This is where you start. It is not a world of peace and beauty and dispassionate rationality, but as Henry James once wrote, quote, life is, in fact, a battle. Evil is insolent and strong, beauty is enchanting but rare, goodness very apt to be weak, folly very apt to be defiant, wickedness to carry the day, imbeciles to be great in places, people of sense in small, and mankind generally unhappy. But the world as it stands is no narrow illusion, no phantasm, no evil dream of the night. We wake up to it again forever and ever, and we can neither forget it nor deny it nor dispense with it. Henry James's statement is an affirmation of that of Job. The life of man upon earth is a warfare, Disraeli put it succinctly. Political life must be taken as you find it. Once we have moved into the world as it is, then we begin to shed fallacy after fallacy. The prime illusion we must rid ourselves is of the conventional view in which things are seen separate from their inevitable counterparts. We know intellectually that everything functionally interrelated. Uh, we know intellectually that everything is functionally interrelated, but in our operations, we segment and isolate all values and issues. Everything about us must be seen as the indivisible partner of its converse light and darkness, good and evil, life and death. From the moment we are born, we begin to die. Happiness and misery are inseparable. So are peace and war. 
The threat of destruction from nuclear energy conversely carries the opportunity of peace and plenty. And so with every component of this universe, all is paired in this enormous Noah's Ark of Life. Life seems to lack re rhyme or reason or even a shadow of order unless we approach it with the key of converses. Seeing everything in its duality, we begin to get some dim clue to direction and what it's all about. It's in these contradictions and their incessant interacting tensions that creat creativity begins. As we begin to accept the concept of contradiction, we see every problem or issue in its whole interrelated si uh, sense. We then recognize that for every positivity, there is a negativity and that there is nothing positive without its con uh, concomitant negative, nor any political paradise without its negative side. Niels Bohr pointed out that the appearance of the contradictions was a signal that the experiment was on the right track. There is, quote, there is not much hope if we have only one difficulty, but when we have two, we can match them off against each other. Bohr calls this complementarity, meaning that the interplay of seemingly conflicting forces or opposites is the actual harmony of nature. Whitehead similarly observed, quote, in formal logic, a contradiction is the signal of a defeat, but in the evolution of real knowledge, it marks the first step in progress towards a victory. Everywhere you look, all change shows this complementarity. In Chicago, the people of Upton Sinclair's jungle, then the worst slum in America, crushed by starvation wages when they worked, demoralized, diseased, living in rotted shacks, were organized. Their banners proclaimed equality for all races, job security, and a decent life for all. With their power, they fought and won. Today, as a part of the middle class, they're also a part of our racist discriminatory culture. The Tennessee Valley Authority was one of the prized jewels in the Democratic crown. Visitors came from every part of the world to see, admire, and study this physical and social achievement of a free society. Today, it's the scourge of the Cumberland Mountains, strip mining for coal and wreaking havoc on the countryside. The CIO was the militant champion of Americans' workers of America's workers, in its ranks, directly and indirectly, were all of America's radicals. They fought the corporate structure of the nation in one. Today, merged with the AF, uh, AFL, it's an entrenched member of the establishment and its leaders supported the war in Vietnam. Another example is today's high-rise public housing projects. Originally conceived and carried through as major advances in riddle, uh, ridding cities of slums, they involved the tearing down of rotting, rat-infested tenements and the erection of modern apartment buildings. They were acclaimed as America's refusal to permit its people to live in the dirty shambles of the slums. It's common knowledge that they've turned into jungles of horror and now confront us with the problem of how we can either convert or get rid of them. They have become compounds of double segregation on the basis of both economy and race and a danger for anyone compelled to live in these projects. A beautiful positive dream has grown into a negative nightmare. It is the universal tale of revolution and reaction. It is the constant struggle between the positive and its converse negative, which includes the reversal of roles so that the positive today is the negative of tomorrow and vice versa. This view of nature recognizes that reality is dual. The principles of quantum mechanics in physics apply even more dramatically to the mechanics of mass movements. This is true not only in complementarity, but in the rep uh, repudiation of the hereth to uh, uh, universal concept of causality, whereby matters in physics were understood in terms of cause and effect, where for every effect there had to be a cause and one always produced the other. In quantum mechanics, causality was largely replaced by probability. An electron or atom did not have to do anything specific in response to a particular force. There was just a set of probabilities that it would react in this or that way. This is fundamental in the observations and propositions which follow. At no time in any discussion or analysis of mass movements, tactics, or any other phase of the problem can it be said that if this is done, then that will result. 
the most we can hope for is to achieve an understanding of the probabilities consequent to certain actions. This grasp of the duality of all phenomena is vital in understanding our, uh, is in vital in our understanding of politics. It frees one from the myth that one approach is positive and one approach is negative. There is no such thing in life. One man's positive is another man's negative. The description of any procedure as positive or negative is the mark of political uh, of a political illiterate. Once the nature of revolution is understood from the dualistic outlook, we lose our mono view of a revolution and see it coupled with the inevitable counter-revolution. Once we accept and learn to anticipate the inevitable counter-revolution, we may then alter the historical pattern of revolution and counter-revolution from the traditional slow advance of two steps forward and one step backward to minimizing the latter. Each element with its positive and converse side is fused to the other related elements in an endless series of everything, so that the converse of revolution on one side is counter-revolution, and on the other side, reformation, and so on in an endless chain of con uh, connected converses. Class distinctions, the trinity. The setting for the drama of change has never varied. Mankind has been and is divided into three parts. The haves, the have-nots, and the have-a-little, want-mores. On top of the haves, with power, money, food, security, and luxury, they suffocate in their surpluses while the have-nots starve. Numerically, the haves have always been the fewest. The haves want to keep things as they are as, and are opposed to change. Thermopolitically, they're cold and determined to freeze the status quo. On the bottom are the world's have-nots. On the world scene, they are by far the greatest in numbers. They are chained together by the common misery of poverty, rotten housing, disease, ignorance, political impotence, and despair. When they're employed, their jobs pay the least, and they are deprived in all areas basic to human growth. Caged by color, physical or political, they're barred any oppor an opportunity to represent themselves in the politics of life. The haves want to keep. The have-nots want to get. Thermopolitically, they are a mass of cold ashes of resignation and fatalism, but inside they're glowing embers of hope, which can be fanned by the building of means of attaining power. Once the fever begins, the flame will follow. They have nowhere to go but up. They hate the establishment of the haves with its arrogance, op with its arrogant opulence, its police, its courts, and its churches. Justice, morality, law, and order are mere words when used by the haves, which justify and secure their status quo. It has been said that the haves, living under the nightmare of possible threats to their possessions, are always faced with the question of, when do we sleep? while the perennial question of the have-nots is when do we eat? The cry of the have-nots has never been give us your hearts, but always get off our backs. They ask not for love, but for breathing space. Between the haves and have-nots are the have-a-little want-mores, the middle class. Torn between upholding the status quo to protect what little they have, yet wanting change so that they can get more, they become split personalities. They could be described as social, economic, and political schizoids. Generally, they seek the safe way where they can profit by change and yet not risk losing the little they have. They insist on a minimum of three aces before playing a hand in the poker game of revolution. Thermopolitically, they are tepid and rooted in inertia. Today in Western society, and particularly in the United States, they comprise the majority of our population. Yet, in the conflicting interests and contradictions within the have a little want mores, it's the genesis of creativity. Out of this class have come, with a few exceptions, the great world leaders of change of the past centuries. Moses, Paul of Tarsus, Martin Luther... Robespierre, 
George Danton, Samuel Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon Bonaparte, Giuseppe Garibaldi, Nikolai Lenin, Mahatma Gandhi, Fidel Castro, Mao Zedong, and others. Just as the clash of interests within the Have a Little Want Mores has bred so many of the great leaders, it's also spawned a particular breed of stalemated by cross interests into inaction. These do nothings profess a commitment to social change for ideals of justice, equality, and opportunity, and then abstain from and discourage all effective active, uh, action for change. They are known by their brand, I agree with your ends, but not your means. They function as blankets, whenever possible smothering sparks of dissension that promise to flare up into the fire of action. These do-nothings appear publicly as good men, humanitarians concerned with justice and dignity. In practice, they're invidious. They are the ones Edmund Burke referred to when he said acidically, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Both the revolutionary leaders or the doers and the do-nothings will be examined in these pages. The history of prevailing status quos shows decay and decadence infecting the opulent materialism of the haves, the spiritual life of the haves to ritualistic justification of their possessions. More than 100 years ago, Tocqueville commented, as did other students of America at that time, that self-indulgence accompanied by concern for nothing except personal materialistic welfare was the major menace to America's future. Whitehead noted in Adventures of, the, of Ideas that the enjoyment of power is fatal to the subtleties of life. Ruling classes degenerate by reason of their lazy indulgence in obvious gratifications. In such a state, men may be said to fall asleep, for it is in sleep that each turns away from the world about us to our private worlds. I must quote one more book pertinent to this subject. In Alice in Wonderland, Tiger Lily explains about the talking flowers to Alice. Tiger Lily points out that the flowers that talk grow out of the hard beds of ground and in most gardens, Tiger Lily says, they make the beds too soft so that the flowers are always asleep. It is <laughs> as though the, a great law of change had prepared the anesthetization of the victim prior to the social surgery to come. Change means movement. Movement means friction. Only in a frictionless vacuum of a non-existent abstract world can movement or change occur without the, uh, without the abrasive friction of conflict. In these pages, it is our open political purpose to cooperate with the great law of change, to want otherwise would be like King Canute's commanding the tides and waves to cease. A word about my personal philosophy. It is anchored in optimism. It must be, for optimism brings with it hope, a future with a purpose, and therefore a will to fight for a better world. Without this optimism, there's no reason to carry on. If we think of the struggle as a climb up a mountain, then we must visualize a mountain with no top. We see a top, but when we finally reach it, the overcast rises and we find ourselves merely on a bluff. The mountain continues on up. Now we see the real top ahead of us and strive for it, only to find we've reached another bluff. The top still above us. And so it goes on interminably. Knowing that the mountain has no top, that is, that it is a perpetual quest from plateau to plateau, the question arises, why the struggle, the conflict, the heartbreak, the danger, the sacrifice, why the constant climb? Our answer is the same as that which a real mountain climber gives when he is asked why he does what he does. Because it's there. Because life is there ahead of you. And either one tests oneself in its challenges or hurdles in the valleys in a dreamless day-to-day -day existence. Uh, I'm sorry. Because life is there ahead of you. And either one tests oneself in its challenges or huddles in the valleys in a dreamless day-to-day -day existence whose only purpose is the preservation of an illusory security and safety. The latter is what the vast majority of people want. What the vast majority of what people choose to do fearing the adventure into the unknown. Paradoxically, they give up the dream of what may lie ahead on the heights of tomorrow for a perpetual nightmare. 
an endless succession of days fearing the loss of a tenuous security. Unlike the chore of the mythic Sisyphus, this challenge is not an endless pushing up of a boulder to the top of the hill only to have it roll back again, the chore to be repeated eternally. It is the pushing the boulder up an endless mountain, but unlike Sisyphus, we're always going further upward, and also unlike Sisyphus, each stage of the trail upwards is different, newly dramatic, and an adventure each time. At times, we do fall back and become discouraged, but it's not that we're making no progress, simply that this is the very nature of life, that it is a climb, and that the resolution of each issue in turn creates other issues, born of plights which are unimaginable today. The pursuit of happiness is never ending. Happiness lies in that pursuit. Confronted with the materialistic decadence of the status quo, one should not be surprised to find that all revolutionary movements are primarily generated from spiritual values and considerations of justice, equality, peace, and brotherhood. History is a relay of revolutions. The torch of idealism is carried by the revolutionary group until this group becomes an establishment, and then quietly the torch is put down to wait until a new revolutionary group picks it up for the next leg of the run. Thus, the revolutionary cycle goes on. A major revolution is to be won in the immediate future is the dissipation of man's illusions that his own welfare can be separate from that of all others. As long as man is shackled to this myth, so long will the human spirit languish. Concern for our, pri uh, for our private material well-being with disregard for the well-being of others is immoral according to the precepts of our Judeo-Christian civilization. But worse, it is stupidity worthy of the lower animals. It is man's foot still dragging in the primeval slime of his beginnings in ignorance and mere animal cunning. But those who know the interdependence of man to be his major strength in the struggle out of the muck have not been wise in their exhortations and moral pronouncements that man is his brother's keeper. On that score, the record of the past centuries has been a disaster. For it was wrong to assume that man would pursue morality on a higher level than his day-to-day -day living demanded. It was a disservice to the future to separate morality from man's daily desires and elevate it to a plane of altruism and self-sacrifice. The fact is that it is not man's better nature, but his self-interest that demands that he be his brother's keeper. We now live in a world where no man can have a loaf of bread while his neighbor has none. If he does not share his bread, he dare not sleep, for his neighbor will kill him. To eat and sleep in safety, man must do the right thing, if for seemingly the wrong reasons, and be in practice his brother's keeper. I believe that man is about to learn that the most practical way of life is the moral life and that the moral life is the only road to survival. He's beginning to learn that he will either share part of his material wealth or lose it all. That he will respect and learn to live with other political ideologies if he wants civilization to go on. This is the kind of argument that man's actual experience equips him to understand and accept. This is the low road to morality. There is no other. 